Bhagavatam, chapter 13, Nature and the Enjoyer and Consciousness. This is five verses in one, so we'll not be able to finish this verse, these five today. So whoever gives class should note that wherever I leave off, they should begin the class on the next Bhagavad Gita from where we left off because uh, it's not possible to finish this in one evening nor should we even try. <clears throat> okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Amanitvam Madam Vidvam Aham Sam Shantir Arjavam Acharya Pasanam Saucham Stairam Atma Vinigraha Indri Arthur Vairagyam Ahankara Evacha Janma Mitru Jaravyadi Doka dosha nu darshanam Ashakti ana bivishvaga Putra dara grihadisu Nityam cha samachitatvam Istani stopapatisu Mayi chananya yogena 
Bhaktiravyabhicharini Vivekta Desha Sevitvam Arati Jana Samsadi Adhyatma Jnanam Nityatvam Tattva Jnanartha Darsanam Etat Jnanam Mitam Prokham Ajnanam Yad Aton Yatha Translation Humility, pridelessness, nonviolence, tolerance, simplicity, approaching a bona fide spiritual master, cleanliness, steadiness, self control, renunciation of the objects of sense gratification, absence of the false ego, the perception of of the evil of birth, death, old age, and disease, detachment, freedom from entanglement with children, wife, home, and the rest, even-minded amidst pleasant and unpleasant events, constant and unalloyed devotion to me, aspiring to live in a solitary place, detachment from the general mass of people, Accepting the importance of self-realization and philosophical search for the absolute truth. All this I declare to be knowledge and besides this whatever there may be is ignorance. So Krishna is explaining these are called the 20 items of knowledge. And, um, and then we'll read First, Prabhupada gives a general description and then he takes each one of them one by one and gives some explanation. This particular purport is about seven pages long. And here, before we say, we say the most, one of the po most important of the 20 items is accepting the importance of self-realization. That's probably the most important here. Accepting the importance of self-realization. These other qualities support that one. Because that's the goal ultimately to become self-realized or will you say develop God consciousness or Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and how do you do that? And one of the ways is philosophical search for the absolute truth. So you see that after all lifting all these 20 items, the conclusion is self-realization. And how do you go about it? Through philosophic search on the absolute truth. So if you can note those two points, then you'll understand all these other and you, you, if you know, if you can note these two points, you'll understand everything else in relationship. The other eighteen now, uh, more or less, support these last two, and the most important one is philosophical search for the absolute truth and and the importance of self real Etat jnana mitam proktam. So I'll read Prabhupada's. Uh, Preliminary, and then before he goes into the different qualities. Hmm. This process of knowledge is sometimes misunderstood by less intelligent men as being the interaction of the feel of activity. Feel of activity means this material body and how the body interacts with different things they consider to be knowledge. But that is incorrect. So Prabhupada starts off by explaining what is not correct. <laughs> you should be, in, in Krishna consciousness, before we can understand what is correct, we also have to cultivate what is not correct side by side. Just to find out what is correct is important, but if we don't understand what is correct, 
we won't understand what is correct unless we understand what is not correct. <laughs> so Prabhupada begins by explaining what is not correct. The activities of this material body and its interaction with the material energy. That is not um, that is not the process of knowledge. So here we get an understanding of what is not the process of knowledge. And people think that just by applying yourself to activities in this world and cultivating some knowledge, connecting those activities, we can understand what is actual knowledge. But Prabhupada said, it's is misunderstood, even by intelligent men. <coughs> is that clear? Because yeah, if you don't understand that first statement, you won't understand the rest of this purport. <laughs> okay. But actually, this is the real process of knowledge. If one accepts this process, then the possibility of approaching the Absolute Truth exists. The process is mentioned here. This is not the interaction of the 24 elements as described before. This is actually the means to get out of the entanglement of those 24 elements. So the acharyas and great thinkers uh, of the spiritual realm have concluded that there are 24 elements that make up the, the interaction of the living entity with the, mode, with the material energy. And what are those 24 elements? Um, the five senses, the five knowledge acquiring senses, the five working senses, the five objects of the senses, um, that's 15. Uh, there's another category. The mind, the intelligence, the ego, the super soul, the living entity. All of these combined make up 24 elements, which is called the essence of Sankhya Yoga. So in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll find that Sankhya Yoga is taught in detail by Lord Kapila Dev. <laughs> what is uh, Sankhya means to count. That is the actual meaning of the word. So counting the 24 elements and realizing that I am not part of those 24 elements. I'm not, I'm not the senses with the working or knowledge acquiring. I'm not the sense objects, I'm not the mind, I'm not the intelligence, I'm not the, the ego. So this is called nati nati nati, not this, not this, not this. Then when it comes down to it, what's left is that there's only two, the soul and the super soul. I am not the, the cause of all of this, which is the super soul, so that's not me either. But I'm, in, I'm interacting with all this, who am I? <laughs> and that who am I is the soul within the body or the part and parcel of Krishna. <laughs> So the interaction with the field of the activities is done through all of these elements, but the soul is aloof from all of that. So if you can understand this, you realize you don't do anything. You, you don't do anything. All you do is desire, and through the mind, you connect with the senses and the objects of the senses, and that is called activity. And it's either on the gross level, uh, or it's on the um, subtle level. Of course, the other five elements are earth, water, fire, air, ether. Yeah. And these are the eight elements, mind, intelligence, and false ego. We're none of these also. And we're not the senses. We're not the... We have ten senses plus the mind. So all of these things are understood through the process of Sankhya. So Prabhupada says this... People in the material world think that knowing this interaction of these 24 elements is knowledge. But here it's mentioned getting out of the entanglement of these elements is actually knowledge. <laughs> so you see the difference. The materialists, they want to 
interact with these material elements and they cultivate knowledge based on that. But we, we're trying to get out of the entanglement of this, these material elements and therefore that is real knowledge. And so these 20 items, or actually 19 items, uh, search for the absolute truth, is the, different, is the distinct one, is, uh, is the actual principle of real knowledge. So if you know these 20 items, then you know what is knowledge, or real knowledge. And that real knowledge gets you out of the entanglement of the material energy. Okay? The embodied soul is entrapped by the body, which is a casing made of 24 elements. And the process of knowledge is described here as a means to get out of it. Of all of the descriptions of the process of the knowledge here, the most important one is described in the first line of the 11th verse, Maya Chani Yogena Bhakti Abhyani Chayani. The process of knowledge terminates in unalloyed devotional service to the Lord. Hmm. So one who is engaged in unalloyed devotional service to the Lord, or full devotional service to the Lord, is one who is in knowledge. <laughs> so you can say, what is a man of knowledge? What is a person of knowledge? One who is fully engaged in devotional service. <laughs> that is knowledge. <laughs> So if one does not approach, or is not able to approach the transcendental service of the Lord, then the other 19 items are old, have no particular value. Wow. Just to practice these activities distinct from devotional service means that they are on the material level or in the modes of material energy. Mm -hmm. And so, before we can actually understand what is real knowledge, one has to see that these items have no value, although they're listed as items, and unless one is engaged in devotional service. Okay, is, is that clear? We're, we want to systematically understand what is being understood here, because if you just see that these qualities are knowledge, but you don't connect them with devotional service, then they are external or superfluous, ephemeral, uh, illusory. In other words, they, they, just like people may have some of these qualities in the material world, but they are not items of knowledge because they just entangle one more in the material energy. Where when you engage in devotional service, these same qualities free you from the entanglement of the material knowledge. So devotional service consists of these activities which free one from the entanglement of, devo of, of uh, devotional service. So it's important to understand how these items are important when they are only used in devotional service. That's why Prabhupada said the most important, the whole, all of this knowledge terminates in unalloyed devotional service. But if one takes the devotional service in Krishna conscious, the other 19 items automatically develop within him. Automatically. As stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam 5.18.12, Yasyasti Bhakti Bhagavati Akinchanayar, Savas Gunas Tata Sam Samastase Surat. All the good qualities of knowledge develop in one who has attained the stage of devotional service. So in this verse, it's, it's quite very, it says that one who is engaged in devotional service has all good qualities. And even though one may see good qualities in people who are not engaged in devotional service, they are not good qualities. Why? Because they are within the modes of material energy. And because they are in the modes of the material energy, they're external and they haven't developed as part of the individual's existence. They don't come from the soul, they come from the mind, that's all. And the mind is always changing due to its association with different modes. Is that clear? 
You have to understand the difference between what is good qualities seen by a devotee and what is a good qualities by a non-devotee. Non-devotee don't have good qualities because they are engaged in the material activity. Which means they are under the influence of the external energy which is always changing. Okay. The principle of accepting a spiritual master, as mentioned in verse 8, is essential. Hmm, here we go. Even for one who takes the devotional service, it is most important. One has to accept a spiritual master. That's one of the items of knowledge. Transcendental life begins when one accepts a bona fide spiritual master. Prabhupada would say during the initiation ceremony, initiation means beginning. So what are we doing if we're not initiated? Are we in devotional service? We are preparing ourselves to get involved in devotional service. What does it mean? Or just like before you go diving into the water, you might want to get the feel of the water, what is the temperature of the water, how deep the water is. Is the water clear or not? In other words, before you actually get into devotional service, you are aspiring to get into devotional service. <clears throat> and once you accept the bona fide spiritual master and work under the guidance of the spiritual master, then by his mercy you can serve the Lord. We can't serve the Lord unless we serve the Lord through pure devotional service. And Krishna doesn't accept anything that is less than pure devotional service. But he allows the living entity to engage in what appears to be devotional service by performing the activities. Just like before you swim, you just get an idea what the water is like. So that's what what we say, aspiring for Krishna consciousness is like. And then, once you accept a spiritual master, then you are fully situated on the path back home, back to God. And all you have to do is follow strictly the instructions of the spiritual master as given by the spiritual master and by Krishna himself through, through scripture. And then you make what we say, tangible and steady progress in the path of devotional service. And what is that steady progress? These other items, the other 19 items, become manifested within the hearts and minds of the devotee through the process of devotional service with the mercy of the spiritual master. Hmm. The principle of accepting the spiritual master as mentioned in the eighth verse, is essential. Even for one who takes to devotional service, it is most important. Transcendental life begins when one accepts the bona fide spiritual master. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, clearly states here that this process of knowledge is the actual path. So Krishna is speaking this verse. So we should understand how authorized this verse is coming from Krishna himself. Anything speculated beyond this is nonsense. <laughs> so outside of these items of, of mentioned here, they're called the items of knowledge, everything else is ignorance, as Prabhupada says, as Krishna says. And he says in the last line, all these I declare to be knowledge, and besides this, whatever there may be, is ignorance. Okay? So you get a little understanding what consists, what, it, what of the items that consist in the process of devotional service. Now in the Nectar Devotion, you have the 64 items of devotional service, and I think it's chapter 10 of Nectar Devotion. And there's rules, there's about 44 rules for things to do and 20 with things to avoid. I think that's the proportion. And those 64 rules and regulations also include all of these 20. 
but they are some of them are, are giving the practical activities of devotional service, like hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. That's also mentioned. Now, Krishna, in the, in the eleventh canto, Srimad Bhagavatam takes those sixty-four items and he condenses it into fifteen. So in that, and it's from the 11th canto, chapter 19, verses 20 through 24, again five verses. Krishna explains what are those 15 items that are the essential activities and qualities of a devotee that, are, that make up the process of devotional service. So we should study those, and then you, don't, you, then you understand everything clearly. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you could be doing things and you think it's devotional service, but it's not. Therefore, therefore, the most important principle is to be guided by knowledge. And that knowledge is given to us by the spiritual master and by Krishna through Shastras. Here Krishna is giving it through Shastra and Priya Srila Prabhupada is explaining it. So you both, you have Guru and Krishna in this combination here. So, now we've, uh, we give a little preliminary of what is about to happen. Now Prabhupada goes through each one uh, point by point and mentions what is, and the first one is, Humility. Now, since it's interesting, Krishna mentions humility first. Why? There's a reason why, huh? Yeah, you can't learn anything if you think you know. Humility is the first process, first principle, because it opens up the door to all of these other qualities. Mm -hmm. And humility is so important that it's seen to be devotional service itself. As opposed to some of these other activities, they're not devotional service themselves, they're the items of knowledge. But one who is humble and, and cultivating humility, they are actually getting the special mercy of the Lord. Humility automatically attracts the attention of the Lord. <laughs> Okay, as for the knowledge outline here, the items may be analyzed as f followed. So now Prabhupada mentions humility. Humility means that one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others. I'll read it again. Humility means that one should not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others. The material conception of life makes us very eager to receive honor from others. But from the point of view of a man in perfect knowledge who knows that he is not this body, anything, honor or dishonor, pertaining to this body is useless. <laughs> One should not be hankering after this material deception. People are very anxious to be famous for their religion and consequently, sometimes it is found that without understanding the principles of religion, one enters into some group, like the Hare Krishnas, which is not actually, would, no, I'm not in some group, no, I'm not, not, not us, okay, I'll cross that out. I forgot to read the rest of the line. <laughs> one enters into some group which is not actually following religious principles and then wants to advertise himself as a religious mentor. So people take to spiritual life for some distinction, for some honor, for some material gain. And Krishna mentions that in the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, no, 7th chapter, verse number 15. He, he explains that four types of people come to me. Those who are in distress, those who are in uh, looking for material gain, those who are inquisitive, and those who are in search of knowledge of the absolute truth. So people come to Krishna consciousness for some material reason. 
And that, Krishna says, that's good, that's fine. But once one becomes practice in devotional service, starts to learn the science, starts to practice the science, and one starts to understand it's not about mitigating or gaining anything from the material energy. It's about developing my love for Krishna. That is the... So one may come for different reasons, but one should understand once they come and become uh, learned, well-versed in the science, they understand, oh, this process is about developing love for Krishna. That is the goal, that is the only goal. And whatever we do in the process is meant to bring us towards that goal. <laughs> okay, so that's the first one. And Prabhupada says, as for actual advancement in spiritual science, one should have a test to see how far he is progressing. He can judge by these uh, items. So this is important. We can take inventory. Am I becoming humble? Am I developing nonviolence? Am I being tolerant? Am I simple? Am I clean? Am I steady? Am I still acting on the level of the false ego? So these are checkpoints. Am I actually following these principles? How much am I following? 50%, 100%, 10%? In other words, we should take inventory and see, am I developing these qualities like that? Okay, so I'll read, that sets humility, and then I'll read one more, and then we can discuss what we talked about so far. So again, humility means not to, one should not be anxious to be, be honored by others because it all pertains to the body. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we used to say some little rhyme in Krishna consciousness, praise and blame, they're only the same, different in name. That's all. Praise and blame are simple, only the same, different in name. <laughs> Because they pertain to the body. Hmm. Okay, so I'll read the next one, nonviolence. Now this now in, this is interesting statement. Uh, put on your seat belts because you're gonna need it for this statement here. Nonviolence is generally taken to mean not killing or destroying the body. But actual nonviolence means not to put others in distress. Hmm either by body, minds, or words. People are trapped by ignorance in the material concept of life, and they are perpetually suffering material pains. So, here it goes. So unless one elevates people to spiritual practice, one is practicing violence. Haribo. If you're not helping others, you are violent. <laughs> How about that one? You can't be neutral. One should try his best to distribute real knowledge to the people so that they may become enlightened and leave this material entanglement. That is nonviolence. By nonviolence does not mean just like, well, I don't eat meat, therefore I'm nonviolent. But you're eating, that's another form of violence. You're walking on the street, that you're, you're killing insects. You're breathing, you're killing insects. You're, sp you're smashing spices in the kitchen. You're also killing living entities. So all of these, in other words, when you live in the material world, you cannot help to be violent. You're automatically violent. Jiva, jiva, sajivanam. But here, it explains that one who's engaged in devotional service, and one of the qualities mentioned here is to help people get free from their sufferings of material energy. If you don't make an effort to somehow or other help others, you're contributing to the violence that they are suffering. <laughs> In other words, human form of life means paropaka. Paropaka means to do good to others. And for a devotee, devotee is always interested in doing good to others. That's what it means to be a devotee. A devotee is concerned not only about their own spiritual advancement, but how to help others receive 
knowledge, be free from suffering, and get onto the path of devotional service like that. Okay, so um, I'll do one more, and then we can go into a questions and answers. Tolerance means that one should practice to bear insult and dishonor from others. People will say things that will disturb you. Learn how to tolerate. If one is engaged in the advancement of spiritual knowledge, there will be so many insults and much dishonor from others. People will find fault with the devotees. They always do. This is expected because material nature is so constituted. Example, Prahlad Maharaj, who was only five years old, was engaged in cultivating spiritual knowledge. And he was endangered when his father became antagonistic to his devotion. The father tried to kill him in so, way, so many ways, but Prahlad tolerated him. So there may be many impediments to making spiritual advancement and spiritual knowledge because we should be tolerant and continue our progress with determination. We should not be disturbed because others find fault with us or criticize or maybe even try to impede our devotional service. Prabhupada makes the point, Lord Jesus Christ, he was crucified by others but he never had any anger or enmity or bad feelings towards his crucifiers. Srila Haridas Thakur is another example. Being beaten in 22 marketplaces, he was only praying for their welfare. So tolerance means to bear insult and dishonor from others. This is one form of tolerance. And of course, there's tolerance that comes by way of the material energy. Too hot, too cold. Prabhupada said, sometimes in the, in the summertime we have to cook in the kitchen, it's so hot. We should not think it's too hot, I'm not going into the kitchen today. Because it's too hot. No, we have to do our service. Or he we use this example, in the wintertime we have to take bath. In India people take bath outside. So even in the wintertime you'll see people bathing outside. in from the wells, like that. So yeah. People will continue to do their duties despite the fact that there is uh, difficulties coming from the material energy. Too much heat, too much cold, uh, uh, rain or snow, so many other calamities that come by way of material energy. And again, people will give you a hard time. We also have to tolerate Sometimes, just like somebody will give you an, something nice, but it's not good for you. It's not good for your devotional life. And so that's another form of you have to tolerate and not accept it, knowing that it's not beneficial. You know, so what appears to be good from the material perspective may not be good for your spiritual advancement. So sometimes we have to reject something that is uh, apparently good from, from one point of view because it's not good from the ultimate point of view of spiritual life. <clears throat> and there are many examples, you know. One will be maybe, give, maybe given some foodstuffs that they very much like, but the doctor says, no, you have to restrain yourself, you have to not eat that. Just like I'm going to our friend here, the Ayurvedic doctor. He gives a long sheet, five pages, with items on both sides. There's about 500 items. And you have to sit there with a pencil. And he says, all right. He, may, he names the item. Pizza, no. Kachoris, no. <laughs> and, no. I'm just using that as an example. But you know he'll go through he'll go through the list and say, well, these things you shouldn't take because of your present condition, and therefore you should follow because. And so we have to tolerate the fact that we, you know, we have to what is good for us from the health reason and from the spiritual reason like that. Maybe associating with 
certain persons or the opposite sex may not be good, although it may look like devotional service. So that's another another example of Krishna conscious tolerance that we have to say no to. <laughs> I'm always chastising the brahmacharis sometimes because they they get too loose sometimes with ladies. So that and it seems to be a nice, pleasant experience, but it's not good for their spiritual life. That's another form of tolerance. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we spoke about humility, nonviolence, and tolerance. So we'll uh, stop here and see if there's any comments, questions on any of these. Whoever begins tomorrow should start with simplicity is the next item in the process here. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm. Regarding this, this first statement that Prabhupada uh, said uh, that um, those those items automatically manifest if we practice devotional service. We were just talking a few, a few verses before. Um, and Niranjana Swami was one asked, one of his disciples, I think it, she, she was a really good book distributor, and she said to him that she felt because she distributed so many books that pride was coming into her. And she, then she asked if uh, she should do something about it or just leave it and... Uh, let Krishna do it in some way that she will get this pride away. And she said, and he said then that, that uh, she can she can live to Krishna, but it may hurt more than if she if she does it something about it herself. So that um, he was he was pointing that she should do something even that she should do something herself to do this this. So, I, but I'm wondering what does this automatically mean? So do we we have to do extra effort? Some or... Well, we find ourselves being faced with these different qualities in day-to-day -day life with interaction with the material energy or with other devotees or with people in general. So we, we should be conscious of these qualities. When tolerance is necessary, we practice it. When humility is required in a certain situation, we practice it automatically means we're conscious of these different items and we're also going to practice them as we go on in our day-to-day -day life. It's not that, well, I don't have to do anything, Krishna will do everything. No, he's telling us what we need to cultivate along with the execution of our devotional service. They are... They are part of and at the same time distinct from devotional service. Mm -hmm. If we don't practice humility, we won't de develop, hum we won't become humble. We have to practice it. So sometimes it says it's good to be put in the situation where we have to be humble, we have to be tolerant, we have to be nonviolent, and that helps us to develop these qualities. Just like you go to school and you learn the lessons in a theoretical way and then when it comes to the test and you have to be able to remember everything you learned and give it back in the form of answers on the test. So we're learning these, these different qualities but then we'll be tested. And how much we learn them will depend on will will depend on how whether we pass the test or not. If we fail the test, then we can continue. Oh, I could have been humble in that situation. I wasn't. Well, and then you learn, and then next time, when you find yourself in situation, you remember how to act. So yeah, we have to. These alams, items come in, pra in the practice of devotional service. So you have to be aware and at the same time practice them. And these are the qualities of the soul because they're actually natural to the living entity. When we're not, when we don't have these qualities and we have something else, that means 
we are simply identifying with the body. Or these are qualities, characteristics of the modes of material energy. That's all. But then again, it has to be done in relationship to devotional service and not separate. Does that help? Yes, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Anyone else? Any? Uh... I have one more. Okay. Um, I just I can't remember which which cant of Srimad Bhagavatam is is this, but um, about humility, I think there there was some. Um, talk about the, of the subcategories of this humility also. I'm not sure who's speaking to whom, but uh, I know that I know that gratitude was one of those subcategories of humility. And I was just wondering, why is this, because maybe humility sometimes for us, it's gratitude is a little bit easier to, you know. Yeah, to that's a, that's a men form of humility, yes. Gratitude, to be grateful for the fact that you have the association of devotees, Grateful for the fact that you have the opportunity for devotional service. To be grateful for the fact that whatever you have is, the, is, the, is coming from Krishna's mercy. That's all. Be grateful to have, if you have good health, be grateful for that. Most people don't. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's one. Compassion is another form of humility. Pridelessness is another element of humility. Mm-hmm. Humility covers a wide range of qualities. <laughs> to be hmm. Give you an example. When you see something that is not right, and out of humility you go along with it, and you say, "Well, but I'm humble. I didn't want to say anything." That's not humility. That's just ignorance. <laughs> humility that doesn't make you stupid or inactive. Using the example of Srila Prabhupada, yeah, Prabhupada spoke very strongly, like a lion, but it doesn't mean he wasn't humble, because he knew that whatever he was saying or doing was on behalf of Krishna, and coming from Krishna originally. So he didn't have to take credit for the results, and he understood that the, the quality is coming from Krishna, the knowledge is coming from Krishna. Mm-hmm. The results is coming from Krishna. Mm -hmm. That's humility. Sometimes we say humility is not not thinking less of yourself, but thinking, but not thinking yourself less, but thinking thinking less. I always mess this up. (laughs) Humility means not. Not to think yourself less, but to... Hmm. Humility means to think yourself less... Hmm. I can't get it right. <laughs> it shows I'm not humble. <laughs> uh, what, how's it go? Humility means to... Not think of yourself less, but to think of yourself less. No, that's not it. Huh? Yeah. Uh, now, humility is not to think of less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. If you're always thinking about yourself, that's not humility. <laughs> I'm so humble, I'm always thinking about myself. <laughs> that's not humility. But think about how to serve, that's humility. Okay, anything else? Yes, uh, some of you, Dutri.
Some of you Jaji were going to volunteer her to be the new GBC of Croatia, I mean uh, Slovenia. Hare Krishna, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I would like to ask about tolerance. Ah. Uh, the, in the association and it, uh, we, uh, someone uh, hurt you, someone uh, someone find faults and behave uh, to you uh, bad. How how much to tolerate this? Uh, how to respond? How to enough knowledge to do this? Because sometimes uh, depends that happens that uh, you have pain in s you tolerate but have pain. From outside you tolerate, but inside uh, her pain is... The pain is, pain is the injury to the false ego. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because we have false ego, we feel pain. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. <laughs> we used to sing that when we were kids. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we, you just have to tolerate. What can you do? If you don't tolerate, then you find yourself getting angry, and then when you get angry, you make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when, we, when these things happen, you just take shelter of Krishna. You say, Krishna, why are you putting me in this situation? What can I learn from this? Mm -hmm. And if you sincerely ask, Krishna will show you mm -hmm, one way or the other. Hmm. Yeah, it's just the way life is. We have to practice tolerance because things come all the way, but when people do it, it becomes even harder. And when people who are close to you cause you pain, that's the, that's the hardest one. If, as it says in the Bhagavatam, if the enemy causes you pain, then you, because you say, oh, it's the enemy anyway, so you kind of write it off, you let it go. But when someone close to you causes you pain, then it, that really goes to the heart. <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Nonviolence, tolerance, humility, any more? Or just in general? Okay, so we can stop here. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. So tomorrow, whoever is going to do the class, simplicity is the next one. <laughs> Nam Yoga, okay. Well, the next Bhagavad Gita class, anyway. Mm. Okay.